Well, this morning we're going to continue then our study in 1 Peter. If you will turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, I told you a few weeks ago my goal was to finish by Easter the book of Peter, and that's been thwarted. So I've changed my goal to Christmas. <laughs> so this morning we're just going to look at one verse, but this verse is oh so rich. And so I decided not to give a review this week because our, our text in chapter 3, verse 8, says to sum up. So there's a natural review even in our text. So I just wanted to highlight as we begin then that Peter, he really cares about our behavior as does our God. And he says it starts from within our hearts. It starts with being born again by the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Spirit making dead men and women and children alive. Then it flows into the body then of believers, and it goes out into a watching world. And it does it in such a way that Peter says they might ask, what is the hope within you? Uh, You'll live in such a way that they realize there's got to be something different. You are hoping in something different than anything else in this world. What is it? That's how evangelism happens. And it's what is missing, I think, from our evangelism today in many areas. We have lost being the signpost in our churches where people come in and say, wow, that's what it looks like when a community is bound by Jesus Christ and a hope of glory. It's visual and it's powerful, and that's the body of Christ. It's what they see in us. And Peter said it's in all of our social realms, from the government to work to right into our very homes. How we respond to mistreatment next week. How do we respond to rejection and slander and with the humility and the gentleness of Christ, we'll put him on display. These are the things that open the door for the word of truth, which is able to save their souls. And today we tend to just tell them uh, just no love or life to match. We just speak truth or we just show them love and we never speak the words of truth. And Peter's teaching us how to live these lives of excellence. I pray that the Spirit is moving and working in your life to be a community of these kind of people. And to this end, let's pray this morning and we'll join our hearts and ask God to do this in our very midst. Father, I thank you for Joe's testimony of putting on display the love of Christ to his bride to the very end where he held, he was with her all the way to the end to glory. God, thank you for that example. I pray, Lord, for this body. I pray that we would so love and treasure this gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel that gives eternal life, the gospel that makes us one with you, Father. I thank you for it, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I pray for this body. God, I pray that you will continue to keep growing and sanctifying us. I pray that we would manifest even what we look at this morning. God, I pray that that would be what characterizes this church. And so we look for you and ask for you to do what no man or woman or child could do. We need the power of your spirit through the word of truth. And we pray that you will give us an uncommon love for you and an uncommon love for one another. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 1 Peter 3.8, to sum up, to sum up, the, the word in the Greek means finally. This is Peter's final point, but it's not his final point of the epistle because we have two more chapters. But it is the final section that we have been studying that if you'll flip back, I'm just going to read those verses again. This began in verse 11 of chapter 2. <coughs> Beloved. I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, you have excellent behavior and they're slandering you as an evildoer, that they may because of your good deeds as they observe them glorify God in the day of visitation which is the day that they get saved. And the day that they get saved, they will thank God for your excellent behavior, even when they were slandering and maligning you for it, because you kept responding like Jesus Christ to them. We have to fight our enemy within, he said, our lusts, and we have to fight with our outer community that persecutes us. So Peter directs us how to battle each. 
one with a tenacity, you abstain from fleshly lusts, and the other with a tenderness and a humility of submission to those persecuting you. Peter then gives us detail of the social spheres in which we're to live out this gospel and how we respond to mistreatment and harm. There have been three spheres in the government we submit to them. With employers who are difficult and hard, we submit to them. And, and in the home, in the realm, with, with husbands who are disobedient to the word, we learn uh, a submission in that realm and how to live in that kind of a setting. So in these spheres, we're to live excellent lives. And I want to remind you one more time for the purpose of evangelism. We, we want to put the gospel on display by these excellent lives that we live in all areas of our lives, which means we're not phonies, we're not hypocrites, this is who we are, and it goes into wherever we go, that is how we're going to live in each and every realm, like Jesus Christ. Now, to sum up, Peter's going to move from a very specific exhortations now to this last, we're going to call it a general exhortation. To sum up, he says, let all Let all, which is everyone in the church, this is being written to the church of believers who have been scattered about in modern Turkey. And so this is all believers. This is to the body of Christ. Here is what Peter says to the church now in summing up this whole section that we have been studying. And in verse 8, he tells us that there's some graces that we're to have. I'm going to call them this morning five pearls. We're going to look at a pearl necklace that every one of us are to wear and how we deal with one another. Then in verse 9, there's a manner that we are to respond to the things that will disrupt these graces, disrupt our unity, disrupt our calm and our own inner peace. And there's a way to respond so that we don't get pulled away from that. And then in verses 10 through 12, Peter's going to give a biblical reinforcement from a psalm to the promises of this kind of a life. And that's where we'll be journeying in the next couple of weeks. So as we look at our pearl necklace this morning, I want you to see uh, verse 8. To sum up, all of you be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit. I want you to see those are mostly attitudes. They're feelings that we're going to have toward each other that flow out of our like-mindedness of the truth. And so the truth is going to produce these kind of emotions or affections toward one another. It's not enough just to be bound together because we all think the same way about every doctrine in the Christian life. That cannot just produce what we're going to look at this morning. That's not the end goal. That's the beginning of the goal. And I have been part of that, and I've seen many churches where that's all that you get. But we do not have what Peter's calling for in this passage. So just to have like-mindedness on every doctrine and not have verse 8, you're going to miss what God is doing through truth in the body of Christ. And so Peter is calling us to more than just that. He's calling for us to be bound together by union in Jesus Christ and the living hope that he showed us in chapter 1 of his soon return and this internal inheritance that we're going to receive That bonds us together. And so I want you to look at the Word of God this morning, and I want you to let it search you, and I want it to change these attitudes in in your heart if they should differ. So if you have any different spirit, heart, or attitude than verse 8, this is a morning to repent before God and to look at the truth and say, God, change me, transform me. If you have something contrary, may God give repentance this morning. May he stir us up by way of reminder to wear this pearl necklace in our gatherings and outside of them before the watching world. And so this is a summary of excellent behavior. So shall we examine then the five graces that the church of God are to manifest to each other? Let's begin with the first pearl. To sum up, all of you then be harmonious. (coughs) The Greek word is phroneo, which means to, to think. But it also carries the idea of thinking that brings about feelings and actions. It's a thinking that that brings about a a commonality, a feeling even. I'm going to use that word a few times. Uh, The other word in front of that for neo is the word homo. And the word homo in the Greek means same. And so he's saying, I want you to think the same. 
I want you to, to bring a, a feeling toward each other, which the other four words will flush out what these feelings are that come from a like-mindedness. So if I had to translate this word, it would be that. It's be like-minded. Come in, uh, saints of God, and be like-minded. It's, it's an inward unity that we have of heart and truth. And I just want to read a few places where this verbal form of this word is found. Here it's an adjective. Peter's going to use five adjectives. And so let me just read a couple to give you a feel for this word. Romans 12, 15 through 16. Paul said, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Have that same mindedness toward each other. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. So have the same mind toward one another and this like-mindedness. 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and there be no divisions or schisms among you, but you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment of how you think and how you think about truth and the realities of them. Be of the same mind together. 2 Corinthians 13.11. Paul says again, finally, brethren, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted. Here's our word, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. This like-mindedness brings about a peace and a unity. Let me read to you, I think, one we know the best, Philippians 2, verse 1. If there's any encouragement in Christ, and these are all first-class conditions, which would mean since there is. Since there's any encouragement in Christ, and since there is any consolation of love, and since we have the fellowship of the Spirit, the same Spirit, since we have any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love. United in spirit, intent on one purpose. There's the like-mindedness. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Have the same mind, maintaining the same love as we join together in the body of Christ. And one more, Romans 15, 5. Paul says, may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. May we have this like-mindedness, this one-mindedness according to Jesus Christ, the cornerstone that we've already seen earlier and previously in this study. The same-mindedness, what is our point of reference? It's Christ. We, we have a same-mindedness toward Jesus, who He is, what He's done, what He will do. We, we are so united and one-minded because we think the same thoughts of the wonderful one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so these Christians have in common uh, verses 1 through 12 of chapter 1 of Peter. They're, they're, they're all like-minded. They have that. So they're like-minded that they're chosen aliens. They've been chosen by God and they've been chosen out to be aliens who are journeying to another country. They have a covenant that they've made to be obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are of one mind. I want to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a beauty in that. There's a oneness that we've been born again to a living hope. And we've been born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we're going to get an inheritance that's protected by the power of God, the perseverance of the saints, and that we are put into a, a furnace. We're like-minded that God will stick us in furnaces to purify our faith. We understand that. We, we help each other journey that. We don't think something strange is happening. We're not health, wealth, and prosperity. We believe you're going to suffer and you're going to get put in a furnace to boil off all the impurities of your faith. We have a hope that is fixed with finality on the coming to you grace of God when Jesus Christ returns. We want to be holy. We fear because of the cost of our redemption, the blood of Christ. We love because we've been born again by the truth. We are the new covenant temple. We are built on the cornerstone, Jesus Christ, and we are living stones perfectly fitted together to put him on display. We want to live in submission to this God so that he will be glorified and many will be saved. Do you see how like-minded we are? 
Do you see the, the one-mindedness that we walk into this church with? It's unbelievable what we have in common. Isn't that enough? Uh, God says it is. Or do we have to have the same view on when the tribulation takes place, at the beginning, the middle, or the end? Or do we have to understand when God's decrees were, were done before the foundation of the world? Or do we have to have absolute agreement on whether we homeschool our kids, private school them, or public school them? Do we have to agree on every conscience issue? And the whole scriptures are saying no. No. What we have in this like-mindedness, in this unity of First Peter, uh, that's our like-mindedness. And, and how much the church has done harm in not putting the unity of the Spirit that we have in Christ on display for our own hobby horses and our own personal agendas. I've watched more people hurt the body of Christ for their own agendas, and you've missed the whole principle of what this body of Christ is to be. Thinking that God is going to smile and say, well done for uh, disrupting the whole body of Christ. The gospel and its realities believed and treasured, filling our minds and our souls, guys, so that we have like-mindedness. We are so like-minded on this blessed hope of in Jesus Christ of what we have together. Laura and I like to laugh about uh, how, how much we almost think the same way now on every subject. It's almost like everything that comes up, we're, we're almost in agreement on everything, and it didn't start that way. <laughs> it's been a journey, but the journey happened because we put the gospel of Jesus Christ at the center of our lives. And when you do that, you'll be shocked how much you grow in unity and oneness uh, in your thinking. It's a beautiful thing. I heard a great illustration this week. There was a documentary that was on the, I think it was the History Channel. And there was a B-24 bomber crew from World War II. And I don't know how long ago it was recorded. But they had gathered and brought the crew of, of, of all of them back together to do all of these interviews from that bomber. And they shared where each one of these people had come from, what part of the crew they worked on, and they did a mini biography on each person. And there were about seven or eight of them on that bomber. And what stood out was the diversity in the background of the crew as they're interviewing them. There was one Jewish, a Hispanic guy, a Swedish guy, they came from large cities and small cities all over the United States of America, and they had this tremendous diversity and tremendous background as they were being interviewed. And the interviewer asked them all as they were sitting around a table at the end of it. He said, did all of these differences ever get in the way of you doing your job on this bomber plane? And the one man said, never that I'm aware of, because we were all taken up in a cause that was bigger than our differences. We, we were one-minded, he said. They were captured by a cause that was bigger than their own differences. And Peter is saying, finally, church, get in. Understand it. Validate the gospel by the way we submit to government and bosses and marriages. The world is against you. It's opposed to you. You are in a greater war than World War II for your eternal souls and the souls of everyone sitting in this place. Therefore, he says, be of the same mind. Get unified on a cause bigger than your own little ones. There's a big one, 1 Peter 1, 1 through 12, that gives us like-mindedness and unity. Be of the same mind. Feed your minds and your hearts upon these things that make us one people after God's own heart. Cling to Christ, the cornerstone, with one Mind. And I just, I love anyone who loves Christ. I, I can meet anyone from anywhere, anytime. I just love you if you love Christ. There's such a beauty and a unity of what we have if you love the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus prayed in John 17, I pray that they would be one. One. Is that how you think? Do you walk into the assembly of God thinking about all that we have in common, our oneness? our unity, what we hope in, who we look to, our foundation, our cornerstone? Or do you walk in thinking about all of your differences? How, how do you walk in? What's your mindset as you even enter in to the body of Christ? Are you taken up in a cause that is greater than your own differences? 
a cause to lift high the name of Jesus Christ to all the nations that people would call and believe upon it. Is that greater than anything that we're battling with these lesser things? I pray that that would be the mindset of everyone who sits here this morning, that we would be like-minded. Let's look at the second pearl. Isn't that first pearl beautiful? It gives beauty to the body of Christ. To sum up, all of you, be harmonious. And now he says, be sympathetic. We get the word pathos here. Pathos. Uh, and soon is a preposition which means together. So to have pathos together, to, to share the same feelings, the same pathos, to have a, a sympathetic heart. Someone is in grief then, and it's to have a sympathetic uh, heart that shares their feelings. If they are in pain or sorrow, my sympathy enters in to their, to their pain and sorrow. The word is not just negative, it can also be positive as well. To enter into the joy of another person as well without jealousy. To, to see someone else be blessed and put in the forefront and have greater gifts or be better looking, whatever it is, to come and say, I, I rejoice. Rejoice with those who rejoice, said Paul. <clears throat> I, can, I can enter into your suffering or I can enter into your joy because we are one and I have a sympathetic heart. Weep with those who weep. We literally feel as if it, as if it was happening to us. Uh, I, when you're hurting, I literally, it, it, I, I'm, I'm as concerned as if it was me. Listen, we live in a world that is filled with selfishness and indifference, and it's growing and it's just getting worse. It is so disconnected. Recently, a school got shot up in Florida and seven people died, 17 people died. And everyone starts ranting and raving about politics and gun control 10 minutes afterwards. No one sheds a tear for the families that just lost their loved ones, and no one sheds a tear for those who survived and what they're going to face the rest of their lives from what they just witnessed. Just in sensitive comments, I pray that the body of Christ would put something completely different on display, that we would show true, genuine sympathy toward one another and our burdens and what we carry. A genuine rejoicing in God blessing someone more than me. And this, again, calls for transparency with each other. When we hurt and when we rejoice, we need others in our lives close enough to know it. And so I'm going to bang on this again and again. A plastic face will never get this done. This is going to be someone who enters into the body of Christ and is transparent. And begins to live an honest life before each other so we can weep with you and we can rejoice with you. It's going to call for that. And then when they do, I don't want you to give Job answers like his friends. What do I mean by that? I don't want you to just come and hurt people more. I, don't, I, don't, they're, they're, I call them verse quoters and you need verses when you're struggling. But the verse quoters just kind of drop a verse on you and it's supposed to fix everything and walk away. There are seasons, the Bible says, where you're just to weep with someone. There's a different season under the sun and I want us to keep growing and learning how to, to know it's okay. We don't like someone to struggle. We just want to fix it with a quick solution. And sometimes there's a season and there's a journey of what God is doing. And so I want us to grow in allowing people to journey what God's doing in their lives and to have wisdom to know how to love people in that. If they're not over it in three weeks, we don't just start popping them like they're not getting over it. I wonder if they're a believer. <laughs> That's not it. That is not it. The beauty of this community is we're one-minded, we're bound together in the gospel, and we're a sympathetic people. The world is crying and looking for this on every turn. And, and if we do it, all men will know, will know that we're his disciples because we have love for one another. This, this will be glorious. This is what everyone is looking for. The third pearl. I want you to look. He says, uh, be, sympath be harmonious, be sympathetic, and now thirdly, be brotherly. A, a brotherly love. Loving each other as brothers. 
affection that you have for those who are close to you in your family. It's a special love, and it's a call back to your members of the same family. You've been born of, of divine blood, not human blood, and you're brought into the family of God. It's a special love. 1 Peter 1.22, since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for what? A sincere love of the brethren, brotherly love, fervently agape one another from the heart. You've been born again, and now you have a brotherly love for this family that you've been brought into. God's people are called out and they're gathered together, the ecclesia, to have a brotherly love and an affection for one another. The whole book of 1 John has a call to brotherly love. He says, this is how you know if you've passed out of death unto life, is if you love the brotherhood. How do, how do I know if I've been born again? God's given me a brotherliness, an affection for my new family, and it will be manifested. It's not just a feeling. It will be manifested in acts and deeds and prayers and encouragements and fighting the fight of faith with each other. I will never for the life of me understand the one who comes and hears a sermon and talks to a couple people and never thinks about their family again until the next Sunday. It, it can't be. That's what I did when I grew up as a Catholic. And this, I've been born again. I've been born again, and there's a love that we have for each other. From the day I was saved at a Billy Graham crusade in 1987, my heart was instantly for my brothers and my sisters. And if there was a need that I heard about, I just wanted to meet it. And it wasn't because God called me to be a minister, but He called me to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And He's called you to be a follower, a disciple of Christ. This is the new life then that springs up in every born-again believer is there's just a brotherly love and affection for the body of Christ. New family, they're my family. I love it. I'm in. Here's my heart. Here's my gifts. God, use me in this family. And I've watched too many break this over the years because they get a personal hurt. They have a conscience difference. They have a doctrinal difference that is not essential they have an administrative issue. They have a worship style difference. They have a preaching style difference. They have a skin difference. They have a political view difference. And they've broken brothers and sisters in Christ. Or brothers and sisters. That means so much to me. I was downstairs. We have a basement and I was working out and I know the First thing that comes to mind is you're saying, Pastor works out? Yeah, <laughs> he does. And Laura's got all these pictures hanging on the wall, so I like kind of moving around. And as I'm looking, it was just all the pictures of my kids, you know, growing up through life. And everyone, you know, the, the three boys are like little puppies. They're laying on each other for pictures and pulling each other's hair. And you just, every picture you could just look and say, oh, they're brothers. They, it's beautiful to watch them together. Um, few weeks ago, one of them's getting married, the tall one. And the other brother, they were trying to figure out, you know, what can we do financially with the wedding and all of that? And the other brother said, I, I can help you financially with whatever you need. And he said, well, his, his brothers are his co-best men. And all I could think about growing up is they fought like cats and dogs. <laughs> but they always reconciled. You know Why? Because they're brothers. And they learned that principle, we're brothers. And that's an earthly affection. And there's something greater that dwells here. There's a spiritual affection. We're brothers and sisters. That's got to mean something. That's got to mean something. We're brothers according to the Spirit. Maybe just sometime with God in the silence of your heart, I want you to just look around right now. And what comes to your mind and your heart as you see the body of Christ? I love preaching because I get to see that. And you get to look around and you just, it's, it's my family. And do, do you love, do you, do you have that? If you don't, something's really wrong. And we're going to address that at the end of the sermon. So I pray that, 
that you have this. And I pray that you don't run from church to church to church that you never get this. This is very important that you get this part of the Christian life because God is going to sanctify and use the body of Christ to grow you. So guys, we need to be harmonious. We need to be sympathetic toward each other. We need to be brotherly. And then fourthly, he, he uses the word kind-hearted. It's a very unique word. It, it referred to internal organs. It, it was your, your bowels. Uh, to, to, to feel it inside. You know, there's this uh, a kindness. I just, I, I feel it in my bowels of mercy. A few verses on this word, uh, Matthew 9, 36. Jesus looks out and he sees the multitudes and it says he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. He looks out, they're like sheep without a shepherd and he, in his very bowels, he feels compassion toward them. Mark 8, 2, I feel compassion for the multitude because they've remained with me now three days and they have nothing to eat before he feeds the 5,000. I, I, he had compassion that they even ha- haven't even had a meal. And then thirdly, in Luke 15, 20, in the prodigal, the prodigal got up and he, in the pig slop and he comes back to his father, but while he was a long way off, His father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him and killed the fattened calf and did all those beautiful things. That was the compassion. He saw his son coming back in repentance. And so this is to have compassion on the very gut level, to be kind-hearted, to feel it in your bowels of compassion. It's a feeling. And the word says this, that, you know, the world looks and they don't care. You, you made your bed lie in it. This is your problem, not mine. I'm not my brother's keeper. I'm going to post all these posts that say, get toxic people out of your life isn't even biblical, so quit posting them. Get toxic people in your life to love them and point them to Christ and help them grow. Goodness. Guys, be kind-hearted toward one another than like our dear Savior. And then lastly, Our fifth pearl, as he says, be humble in spirit. Be humble in spirit. Many have called this the chief grace. It means to be humbly minded. Philippians 2, 3, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important as himself. And then he'll go to the greatest example, the one who existed in eternity and did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, humbled himself, taking on the the form of a bondservant to the point of death, even death on a cross. He's saying, have your mindset like Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 5, 5, in a couple chapters, he's going to say, you younger men, likewise be subject to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. God stands against the proud, but grace flows into the life of the humble. Clothe yourselves with humility. This word was a very despised Greek word, uh, a word in the Greek world. They hated it. And, And so it is today. It's always been seen as weakness to this world. But it's beautiful to God to be humble before your God and before others. I love when Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. How, how do I come to the living God? For I'm gentle and humble in heart. I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart. The pride of the church. It's fighting in society. Its whole role now is to fight the government. Its whole role is to fight at work, to get your personal rights. Its whole thing now is fighting in your home. You're not the boss of me and all the stuff that goes on. It's just fighting, 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 fighting in the church for your own name, your own agenda, your own recognition. We stand aloof from the world and we judge them. Unbelievers are not our enemy. They're our mission field and we do not look down on them Uh, We don't look down on churches that are not reformed and snub them. There's so much haughtiness in our day and age, and I'm telling you, it just goes on and on and on. We're a church that's been saved by the Son of God, 
who took up a basin and a towel and washed his disciples' feet and said, follow my example. We were saved by the one who did not think equality with God, that that thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. And he did. He went up on a cross and he died. We were redeemed by his blood being spilt out in our place. And now you want to be King Tut? I want all of this to be about me. I'll fight for my own rights. My truth is the most important. Everyone needs to listen to me. My grief is the most important. My joys are all that matter. I pray that you would look at the fountainhead of all of Christianity, and I pray that we would have humility, the chief grace from which all the other ones flow, a a, a like-mindedness and humility, a sympathy because of humility that isn't always just looking out for yourself, a brotherliness because of humility, and a kind-heartedness because I'm humbled and broken before God with who I am before this Holy One. And so I pray that we'll all wear this pearl necklace. I pray that all five graces would be put on display by every member of Southside Bible Church because the pearl of great price was sacrificed willingly for us. And I pray that would be, we never get over that, and it produces humility and a kindness and a tenderheartedness and an openness, and we just can't get over what we have in common And it's just, man, it's a family reunion every Sunday. It's a family reunion throughout the week. I've got to get my family to my house throughout the week. I'll do whatever it takes. It's just, it's my family. I pray that the gospel has produced that and you're not just happy with your doctrine. I pray that your doctrine is producing these five graces and that we'll all wear this necklace. So I'm going to just kind of close out. I want to close out with... Maybe the first one I want to address is, is the one who doesn't have these graces. You, you really don't have any of these in your life, if you'll be honest before God, because legalism will never produce this. Legalism is you trying to do good things to get God to love you. It's trying to, to work out your own righteousness before God. And so the, the one who has, if you don't have these graces, legalism won't produce them. They won't come out. These can only come from a vine. This can only come from Jesus Christ being a vine and us being the branch and Him manifesting these through us. So if you are completely void of these graces, this morning I want you to fall on the cornerstone. The one who has come and, and did, he lived the life you should have. He lived a perfect righteousness. He died the death that you deserved on a cross. God's justice was poured out for your sin on his own son, hanging on a cross in your place. And that Jesus is hung up there saying, all I ask is that you come with nothing in your hand. Quit trying to clean yourself up. Quit trying to do good works and believe in the one who's done it all. Believe and you will be saved. You'll be forgiven and washed and cleansed and brought back into a relationship with God. Come. Don't spend your days fighting about doctrine and never manifesting these graces in your life. If your life is void of these graces, you're not joined to the vine. You're not joined to the vine. So come to the one who can make these flow into your heart and toward other people. And so I just invite you this morning to come to him if this is the most foreign thing you've ever heard in your life. If if I've taken all your religiosity and just pulled open the, 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 the curtain and now you're exposed before God for your heart and who you really are. I don't care if you've been in church 30 years. This morning there's a savior for people who are mean and broken and hating and can't ever love anybody. There's a Savior that you've been hiding behind religion, and I want you to just come out from it and come to a Savior who's able to save to the uttermost all who draw near to God through Him. And then secondly, I just want to help my dear brothers and sisters who have this in seed form, and some maybe it's flowering, But if this morning you say, I want to grow up into an oak tree for the glory of God and the good of my my brethren and the good of lost souls, this whole section, I want to be that. I want to be a tree that that people are going to glorify God on the day of their visitation because of my excellent behavior. I want that. This week I came across some good help from a a preacher that's one of my heroes of the faith, and, and and he talked about how do we get these because... 
Several of these are feelings. Several of them, kind-heartedness and, and sympathy. There, it, it isn't just, okay, I have a knowledge here, but th- there's something that you feel toward one another. There's an affection that comes from our, our truth and our like-mindedness. So how do I get feelings? Can God command us to feel this way toward one another? Or do you just want to leave it up there cold and sterile and just say, no, you just do it? These are feelings that come out of truth. And so we're called to feel the things toward one another because of the truth that we know and believe. And so I've always used that Edwards illustration where he says your mind, your thinking, stirs your affections, which activates your will. And so the truth has to give affections, and that's going to bring your will to start doing this toward one another, to get out of your comfort, lazy zone, thinking only about you. The truth has got to get your heart stirred up to say, I'll do this. I'm going to activate my will. I'm going to obey. I'm going to love agape. I'm going to set my will to love this church. So the question is, how how do I grow in them then? How do I grow? Because feelings are going to fluctuate. They're going to be up and down. Love, agape is volitional. You choose it and your feelings will go up and down. But sympathy, kind-heartedness, brotherly love, there has to be some kind of affection. This can't be my whole Christian life. I feel nothing for anyone else, but I just do it because God said so. That misses the whole passage. I like that in one sense, and I hate it in another sense. There's one sense I just, I will set my will to obey, but if I don't have any affection at all for other people ever, never, something is broken. And so I'm going to give you five R's for how to grow in these affections toward one another's. First, if you look in 1 Peter 3, 10, <clears throat> for the one who desires life to love and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. He must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace uh, and pursue it. So the, the turn away is the, the word for repentance. So you, you need to repent. Turn away from the contrary feelings and responses that you have toward the body of Christ. So if I have a contrary feeling that feels bitter or hurt or wrong, then I just want to get away from somebody. He's saying, turn away from that. Fight it. Don't get into it. Don't let it dwell. Don't hold on to it and build a grudge and move into bitterness. Turn away from wrong responses. Unsympathetic, turn from it. Uh, I'm against you, unsympathetic heart. I turn from this. I'm not going to let that dwell and be in my heart. Repent. Repent for thinking wrong and acting wrong in this area. Second, resort to Christ. I'll go back to 1 Peter 2, 4. Coming to him was a present tense. Coming again and again and again to Christ. Draw near to Christ and don't let him go. Don't say, I tried it and it didn't work. Keep coming to him until these graces bubble up in your life, until you're wearing the pearl necklace. Don't stop coming to him. Because in him, there is power and there is transformation to to bear fruit through these little vines that we are. There is a way to get this fruit that we're looking at to just keep growing and getting more and more luscious Keep coming to Christ if you don't have these. And if you do, keep coming to Christ. Thirdly, he says, relish some sweet word. In 1 Peter 2, 2 through 3, it says to be thirsting for the word of God like a newborn babe for its mother's milk. He said, since you have tasted of the goodness of God. Thirst for the word of God that the Lord is good. And meditate on the goodness of God. And as you do, it produces these new feelings. So when when I feel like God is just a cosmic killjoy who's against me, looking to destroy me, I feel none of these things toward the brotherhood. But when I'm delighting in the gospel and the goodness and the kindness of our God, I feel like these are a mighty river just flowing and bubbling over. Meditate. Let that word of God do this. And then request change from God. Go back to 1 Peter 3.12. For the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his, his ears attend to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. God's eyes are upon you and his ears are open. God, please make me more tender and sympathetic and humble and brotherly. God, will you produce these in me? He hears your cries. 
And then resolve, fifthly, to act with feeling. Everything within you wants to say something back when somebody mistreats you at work or the government or someone in a body of Christ or in your own family. Everything within you just wants to argue back and prove your point. Instead, resolve to bless them. We'll see next week. God, I pray your blessings and your grace upon that person. And I'm going to resolve to not act the way my flesh is feeling and the way my flesh desires. Some of you, if your flesh feels it, you do it. And this is a call to resolve, I'm not going to go that path. I'm not going to walk those steps. You may walk up to someone and there's tension and there's conflict and I don't really want to be reconciled to him. I'm afraid of that. And you resolve and you go to the meeting anyways and something happens. I just, I resolve to keep connecting, keep growing, and keep working, and keep manifesting these graces and these fruits. And so, guys, this is how you walk with God, trying to obey Him by having love and feelings toward the body of Christ. It's not a spigot that you just turn on and off, but God can and will give these to you that you might grow in respect to salvation. I can't imagine telling my wife, I love our vows that we took. The laws of marriage, I believe in them, I act upon them, I just don't have any feelings for you. That would not work. And I hear that in the body of Christ. And I'm telling you that, that it, it is a, a truth, it's a love that we're going to set, and there's feelings, affections that I have toward the body of Christ. There has to be. I don't care if you're an engineer or an art major. You should have affections. And I'm not saying emotions. I'm saying affections for the body of Christ. And so let's put on our pearl necklaces, amen? And how, how beautiful would this be? All men would know we're his disciples if we have this kind of love for one another. And I, I am going to just keep praying and seeking God for every one of us in this area, that it will just keep bubbling. And then in closing, as a pastor, I think you need to hear, I am so happy with how well you are growing in this, you're doing this. I am just blown away week after week with the things I'm watching, seeing, and hearing of how you're doing this with each other. And so I, I commend you, but let's excel still more. <laughs> Till glory, there's just a lot more growth that we can find, have, and give to one another. So let's join our hearts together. We are one mind because of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the unity that we have in Christ Jesus. I thank you for Peter exhorting us. I, I think of the guy exhorting us. This isn't what characterized him early in his life. And I love that this is what characterized him towards the end of his life. God, let that give hope to someone who might be crotchety for 30 years. God, that even this morning they realize the power of God can begin through, through that uh, vine uh, th just to start producing this kind of fruit. And so, Lord, I pray that it would hang on all the limbs of every soul here this morning. God, I pray that the fruit would just keep growing. It would keep blossoming and, and feed the nations. God, it would feed our families and our workplaces and our neighborhoods and our kids. Lord, I pray for this kind of a fruit that many would glorify God in the day of their visitation because of our excellent, beautiful behavior that manifests Jesus Christ to each other and to this world. God, we thank you for our perfect example. The Lord Jesus Christ, may we walk in his footsteps and may we walk in his power to live the life that he has called us to by grace. And it's in Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen.